For almost 2,000 years, adventurous sailors talked of far distant lands where dragons still roam the earth. But little was known about this mysterious cluster of islands known as the Komodo region. For centuries, it remained an unspoiled paradise where only a handful of people dared to venture. For this was the kingdom of the dragon. These three-meter monsters are the last remnants of a time when giant reptiles dominated the planet. They are Komodo dragons and can only be found at the heart of the Indonesian archipelago around the islands of Rincha and Komodo. The Komodo dragon is king of its domain, but it is also part of a delicate ecosystem with a diverse range of interdependent species. To the advantage of the dragons, the area has long been protected by a natural moat of fierce currents which encircle the islands. For centuries, the Komodo region was considered an area to be best avoided. This isolation has enabled the dragons to survive and flourish without the threat of human slaughter. But the currents which have served to protect the dragons have also restricted their domain. Although dragons can swim short distances, the torrential waters surrounding the island group form an impenetrable barrier to other areas. Today, their kingdom is limited to several adjacent islands. On these shores, the Komodo dragon has been the uncontested ruler for nearly four million years. It was only several hundred years ago that people first settled in the dragon's domain. But scant knowledge remains about these few early inhabitants. They were known as the Atamodo, and today, little but their stories survive. Not surprisingly, the dragons played a significant role in their myths. Legend has it that the founder of the Atamodo and the dragon were twin brothers 
born from the union of the spirit woman Ampunaga and a man who lived long ago on Komodo Island. Because of this mystical bond, the Atomodo believed that their destiny was linked with that of the dragon. If harm should come to the dragon, they believed it would also come to them. This protective attitude has surely contributed to the survival of this last great lizard species. In fact, the dragon's present existence may owe much to humans in the past. Early settlers introduced a variety of animal species, which now form the bulk of the dragon's diet. Water buffalo, wild boar, long-tailed macaw, and wild horses were all introduced by settlers and have flourished in some of the best preserved savanna grassland in the Indonesian archipelago. The most significant import to the islands, however, is the Timor deer, which has long been the main staple for the dragons. Komodo dragons have highly flexible joints in their jaw and skull. This enables them to consume large chunks of meat in one gulp. Brute force is used to tear the animal apart. Dragons don't chew their food but almost every skerrick of the animal will be devoured, including the fur, hooves, and bones. A hungry dragon can consume up to 80% of its body weight in one meal. It will take several days to digest the deer. To aid this process, the dragon rubs its belly over the ground, then retreats to find water. It may be up to a month before this dragon has its next large meal. Timor deer and the other large mammals currently provide the bulk of the dragon's diet. But before their introduction, it was believed that primitive deer and pig species roamed the plains. Paleontologists have also uncovered evidence that the region was once inhabited by primitive elephants, known as stegodon. Scientists believe these small elephants were probably the main food source for the dragons. Komodo dragons can't afford to be fussy about their meals and have been known to savage humans. This local school teacher was lucky to survive a dragon attack. Incidents are rare, however, and it is sometimes hard to distinguish myth from reality. The mysterious disappearance of Swiss Baron Rudolf von Redding has now become legend. He was walking alone in the 
hills of Komodo when he vanished without a trace. Many believe that he was consumed by dragons. A harsh climate prevails in the kingdom of the dragon. Drought conditions dominate for eight months of the year. After a poor wet season, the annual rainfall can be as low as 200 millimeters. It is the driest area in Indonesia. But the Komodo dragon is well adapted to this arid environment. It preserves water by secreting very little of its precious body fluids and receives 85% of its water requirements via the flesh of its prey. To help regulate their body temperature, dragons build deep burrows into the sides of hills. At night, this is used as a warm place to sleep. During the sweltering hours around midday, it serves as a cool refuge from the unforgiving sun. The kingdom of the dragon is one of the few remaining bastions of reptile domination. Numerous lizard species flourish on the islands. There are nine skink species and several varieties of tree-dwelling gecko, a favorite meal for hungry young dragons. But Komodo dragons are not the only threat to the lizards. Snakes are also abundant on the islands. Camouflage is a lizard's best protection, but once detected, it has little hope of escaping the clutches of a rat snake. Despite a valiant effort, the gecko finally succumbs to the overpowering weaponry of its attacker. Like the dragon, this snake swallows the lizard whole, allowing powerful stomach acid to break down its meal. This animal may not be hunting for a while, but there are always others in the area waiting to strike. There are 12 species of snake on the islands, some of which are highly venomous. However, this doesn't always prevent them from ending up on the dragon's dinner table. The green tree viper and its rare blue cousin are two of the many reptiles in the dragon's diet. Usually, these snakes can avoid capture by staying high in the trees. By the time dragons have grown large enough to deal with snakes, 
Their enormous weight ensures gravity will show them where they belong. It takes a hungry dragon to invest so much energy. There are easier meals to be had when one knows where to look. Hawksbill and green sea turtles are familiar visitors to the shores of Komodo and Rincha. Once every two or three years, individuals return to the place of their birth to lay eggs and replenish the species. Up to 150 eggs will be left buried in the sand. Many of these will be plundered by dragons. However, they won't find all the nests. The remaining sites are often raided by poachers. It's not just the eggs that are sought after. Turtle meat is enjoyed by man and beast alike. These animals have long sustained consumption by dragons. But the additional toll from worldwide poaching threatens their survival. Sea turtles have become an endangered species. It may be up to 50 years before the full impact of current nest robbing will be felt. Only then will the few surviving turtles be old enough to produce the next generation. These turtles could live as long as 90 years but to survive the hazardous growing period, they must first navigate their passage into the deep ocean, past the onslaught of fish, birds, and humans. In the past centuries, the few inhabitants of the region made little impact on the environment. To the advantage of the dragons and other wildlife, the population has remained low due to the inhospitable climate and lack of fresh water. But in recent years, trade and technology improvements have allowed the population to grow beyond the area's sustainability. Since the 1930s, settlement has increased by 1,000%, and the region's resources are being pushed to the limits. The Atamoto people customarily shared food with their dragon brothers by leaving out a portion of each meal. But nowadays, the dragons must compete with the villagers for the dwindling resources. During the dry season, the rivers on Komodo and Rincha will evaporate. 
the villagers must then rely on a few natural springs and wells to meet their needs. Water sources are also the meeting point for most of the wildlife on the islands, particularly the mammal species. These locations are ideal for ambushing unwary victims. Although dragons can deliver powerful bursts of speed, many animals are too quick to catch on the run. In the kingdom of the dragon, water is not only the giver of life, it is also the bringer of death. The prey is not always killed outright. A single bite is often all that is needed. The Komodo dragon doesn't inject poison as such, but its saliva contains at least seven strains of toxic bacteria. A wounded animal may get away, but the infection from the bite will eventually lead to its demise. A dragon's prey does not always go down without a fight. Wild pigs sometimes compete with dragons for the same food. This can lead to tense confrontations. The sow can stand her own ground, but the boars have tusks and have been known to pierce and even kill adult dragons. A dragon will always prefer feeding off a carcass to risking injury in pursuit of living prey. The wild boar has died from an infected wound. But this hungry animal knows it doesn't have long before company will arrive. A dragon can detect a rotting carcass from up to 11 kilometers away. The scent is collected on the tips of its forked tongue and drawn back to receptors at the rear of its mouth. This sensory organ analyzes the variations between each tip sample to accurately determine the direction of the odor. Dragon's teeth bear closest resemblance to those of dinosaurs. They are hidden behind the gums, which often bleed during a meal. This festering blood adds to the toxic cocktail within its mouth. It uses its teeth like a saw to tear and prise the flesh apart.
The dragon's flexible jaw proves useful in its ambitious attempt to swallow the head before more hungry diners arrive. Although dragons live a mostly solitary life, feeding is often a communal affair. This is where young dragons learn the rules of the game, including some questionable dinner etiquette. There is a predetermined order to this chaos, and social hierarchy plays an important role. The smaller dragons soon learn to keep their distance lest they end up on the dessert menu. A Komodo dragon is not particular about where it gets its next meal, including from its own kind. This animal must bide its time in the hope that something will be left behind. A carcass of this size will take several hours to consume. But there is always one wise guy who insists on takeaway. The dragon will attempt to lose its pursuers among the cavernous branches of the mangrove forest. These entangled root systems are the fortress walls of the dragon's kingdom. They are spread around the coasts and form a natural barrier against soil erosion. The mangrove forests offer multiple ecosystems because they provide habitats for both terrestrial and marine creatures. The amphibious mudskipper fish spend their lives on the tidal plains of the mangroves. They are believed to resemble the first prehistoric fish that ventured onto land. Mudskippers store water in their guild chambers, enabling them to stay above water indefinitely. When the tide retreats, it is also time for a synchronized performance from the local fiddler crabs. This display is actually a fertility dance to attract worthy partners. Unfortunately, it can also attract unwanted respondents as well. Crabs are a favorite meal for the long-tailed macaw. These animals, in turn, are hunted by the Komodo dragons. Today, however, the monkeys are lucky. 
The dragons are already occupied, fighting over the last Skerrix of the wild boar. Fights often occur around a meal site. Confrontations usually begin with a standoff. Dragons demonstrate their strength by adopting an aggressive pose and producing a deep hissing noise. They first size up their adversary before launching an attack. The battle is usually short. The victor holds down the vanquished until it surrenders. Such confrontations also establish mating preferences. Fighting and mating rituals are often confused by observers, as the behavior of both is very similar. It is not all rough and tumble in the dragon's world. There is also time for relaxation and courtship. The difference between the sexes is not visual even to the experts. Komodo dragons use smell to locate a worthy partner. This inexperienced male approaches a larger female. It is clearly an unworthy suitor and the female briskly demonstrates her objections. But a mismatched male sometimes risks more than mere rejection. In more evenly balanced encounters, an unwilling female will run away. But playing hard to get is a common ploy, even in response to a worthy suitor. This only seems to spur the male on with greater determination. Eventually, the female yields to the male's advances and mating begins. The male dragon locks the female in a restrained position to protect itself from injury. But this doesn't mean that the female comes away unscathed. The deed is done and the female retreats into the forest. In around 40 days, she will seek out a nesting site to lay her eggs. Komodo dragons always take the easy way out. She will prefer to adapt a pre-existing nest to digging one from scratch. And no nest suits her purposes more than that of the megapode, an industrious scrub fowl that roams the forests of the region. These birds may be small, but their enormous nests can grow to a height of two meters The rotting vegetation inside the nest generates enough heat for the single egg to hatch on its own. 
But it seems that this time, the poor bird's hard work will not be used for its own egg. The temperature near the surface of a megapode nest is usually too hot for dragon eggs. So she needs to burrow deeper down. A dragon will defend her nest only until she has finished laying her clutch. After that, the eggs, like those of the megapode, will be left to their own fate. Komodo dragon eggs fall prey to many animals, including to other dragons. Only about a quarter will make it through the eight to nine month incubation period. These animals and their carnivorous habits are the product of four million years of finely tuned evolution. It is the additional human pressures which most threaten their survival. The rapidly changing conditions brought on by settlers have given the dragons little time to adapt. Over the last century, many animals have been killed or shipped off to foreign zoos. Poachers have also destroyed vast tracts of land in their quest for an easy dollar. Their prey is usually Timor deer, but the consequences take their toll right down the food chain, from the smallest creatures of the savanna to the Komodo dragons themselves. The dragons may escape the flames, but their vital food sources are being depleted and destroyed. The island of Padar was once home to Komodo dragons. But by 1970, poachers had decimated the island's deer population. It wasn't long before the dragons themselves disappeared. The Timor deer have since recovered from the onslaught. Hopefully, in time, the dragons will also return. There have been several sightings since their disappearance in the 70s, but these were probably visitors from nearby Rincha who'd swum the turbulent waters between the two islands. For the Komodo dragon, the currents are nothing but a hindrance. But the underwater world which surrounds its realm is a precious kingdom unto itself. The swirling waters hide a unique underwater paradise which is only now receiving recognition. From the gentle giants of the sea, the whales and dolphins, to the kingdom's tiny knights, the pygmy seahorses, this area boasts a biodiversity rarely equaled. There is still much to learn about the area. 
This unique white manta ray is still a mystery to science, with only a handful of sightings to date. One of many untold treasures waiting to be discovered around the Komodo region. The delicate ecological heritage, both above and below the water, has been recognized by the Indonesian government. In 1980, they designated the entire domain of the dragon, plus the surrounding waters, as a national park. This important decision put limitations on human expansion within the park to help preserve these amazing animals and their environment. In 1991, UNESCO declared it a World Heritage Site, an honor given to only two other locations in Indonesia. It requires more than accolades to protect the dragon's kingdom. The true knights of the dragon's realm are the Komodo National Park Authority and their support organizations. Ten ranger outposts have been established around the islands to enable year-round protection for the Komodo dragon and its prey. The rangers are also responsible for managing the growing tourist trade within the park. Armed only with forked sticks, they protect visitors from the dragons, who occasionally like to show who's boss. Sometimes, they even like to do their own camera work. Working with dragons is not the riskiest part of the job. Foot patrols scour the countryside on the lookout for poachers. Police and army personnel sometimes accompany the rangers. A necessary precaution after numerous gun battles. It is a dangerous and demanding job that has cost some recruits their lives. But it's not just the dragon's land which needs protecting. The surrounding seas are also under threat. International demand for live fish has encouraged the proliferation of destructive fishing methods within the park. Divers using unreliable breathing equipment hunt large reef fish in their coral hideouts. To aid capture, cyanide is squirted into the crevices. This temporarily immobilizes the large prey, but the residual cyanide kills all small fish and coral in the vicinity. To gain access to the quarry, large coral formations are sometimes smashed out of the way. For each fish captured, more than one square meter of coral habitat is killed off. When a reef area is destroyed, 
the divers move on. To combat this short-sighted practice, patrols police the park's waters in search of illegal equipment and spoils. Perpetrators are caught regularly. But many are small players, desperate to earn a living in a climate where jobs are scarce. Cyanide fishing and poaching bring good money. But offenders are sometimes unaware that their short-term gain will ultimately deprive them of their own future. These damaging practices are likely to continue unless alternative means of income can be found. Here, the park authority is fortunate to have the support of the Nature Conservancy. The TNC is the world's leading private conservation organization and has invested extensive resources into the region. TNC and park authorities are working together with the local community to re-educate and create new job opportunities that are kinder to the environment. These include jobs in ecotourism, new sustainable fishing businesses, and conservation work. Only together with the community can these organizations hope to protect the Kingdom of the Dragon. Luckily, they also have nature on their side. Some of what humans have destroyed, nature can rebuild. In late December, the wet season finally arrives. Warm northwesterly winds and tropical rain bring welcome relief to the parched earth. New life blossoms, and the creeks and rivers flow once again. This is the time for a fresh generation of animals to walk their first steps through the lush new vegetation. At the end of the rainy season, it is time for dragon hatchlings to venture from their nests. The abundance of new life offers easy meal opportunities. But this young dragon is not safe as long as it stays on the open forest floor. At this vulnerable size, it can easily fall prey to other animals particularly to older dragons. Few will survive past the infant stage. The adult has picked up the fresh scent around the nest, and it is only a matter of time before it tracks down the baby. This is part of the natural culling process that ensures the survival of the fittest. The dragon follows the scent trail, but the lucky hatchling has had enough of a head start to reach a safe haven. The adult is far too heavy to follow it onto the vulnerable boughs. 
This three-meter dragon lost the ability to climb long ago. Something that the young hatchling will also discover in time. For the next two or three years, however, the trees will be its home. The Komodo dragon will face many dangers along the journey to adulthood. But its greatest threat, as well as its biggest hope, rests on our shoulders. It is up to us to ensure that this unique animal and the diverse environments around its domain survive for the generations to come.